glad to be in the house of the Lord once more and again. Hallelujah. We ask that you just stand as we get our hearts and our minds set on service. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says, oh, clap your hands, all ye people. And it says, shout with a voice, not just a voice, but a voice of what? Triumph. And it says, sing songs of joy. Hallelujah. This morning we come to clap our hands before the Lord. Amen. We come to shout because we know there's victory in the name of Jesus. Amen. And then we come to sing songs of joy, amen? Because sometimes our week has been filled with trials and tribulations, but we come to celebrate this morning because we know that we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask, I think. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to give God glory. I came to give God praise because he's worthy to be praised. So tell your neighbor, said, I'm putting everything behind me. I'm laying all my problems at the cross because nobody can handle it like my father can. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray. Father God, we thank you because you're awesome, God. We thank you because no folk can stand against your great power, God. Lord, we thank you because you're worthy, God. The God who sits high and looks low. The God who knows all. The God who knows our future. The God who knows our purpose. Today we come to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for waking us up, God. Thank you for health and strength, God. Thank you for family, God. And God, thank you for victory in your name, Lord. And God, today we come to lift up holy hands, God. Oh, God, we praise you. God, we come to magnify your name today, Lord, God. We come to give you glory today, God. And everything, God, that would hinder us, God, we take it and we lay it at your feet, God. You said, cast all your cares upon you, God, because you care, God. And God, we cast it all on you, God. And as we prepare to hear from the man of God, we pray that you would touch, God, that you would anoint him afresh, God, that you would minister to him so he can minister to us, God. And as he speaks your word, God, that it won't just go into the air, God, but it will attach itself to the depths of our hearts, God, so that when we leave here, God, we will no longer be the same, God, but we will be better than we were before we came, God. And God, we thank you for all that you're going to do in this place today, God. We thank you in advance, God, for deliverance, for peace, God, for victory in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Come on, somebody give him a shout of praise. Give him a shout of Trump triumph. Hallelujah. Are we ready to go higher and praise the Lord? Amen. Give our music ministry a hand as they come.
just throw down your fears and come running to me. Cause I loved you before, you knew it was a love. I saw it all, still I chose the cross. And you were the one that I was thinking of when I rose from the grave. Thank you.
it up in this house if you believe this. Shout and say, I'm all. Savior, I'm already love. Already One more time, can we lift that up? Say I'm already. I'm Why we can declare in the house and say, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. I just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Does anybody love him in the house? talking about the love of God this morning. Can we raise our hands and testify? Say, I'll never, I'll never know how much it costs much it cost just to see my sin.
Come on, last time I give. Give myself away. So I. So you can choose me. Amen. Right where you are, right where you are, with hands lifted just for a moment. Father, we thank you. How we honor you. How we adore you. How we magnify you. How we exalt you. How we extol you how we worship you. We thank you for this precious moment. We present ourselves this morning as a gift, as a conduit. And God, we ask that you would speak to us. And God, ultimately that you would speak through us. But God, we have presented ourselves today as an empty vessel to be filled up. And we say, Lord, have your way in this place today. Fill me up, God, until I overflow. Until I overflow in my classroom. Till I overflow in my workplace. Till I overflow on the highways. Till I overflow in every place that I frequent. And God, I'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the saints of God said amen, amen. Come on, take 10 seconds and give God the best praise you can give him. Look at your neighbor and say, now, you know that's not the best praise that you could give him. I say, give him the best praise that you could give him. Amen, amen. Thank God for our music ministry taking us into the very presence of God. The song says, here I am to worship. Do you know the word worship is greater than lifting your hands? And it's greater than lifting your voice? The word worship comes from the word worthship, which means that when I show God's worth, I'm worshiping him. So I don't have to be in the sanctuary to worship him. I could be in the Walmart worshiping him. Grab your Bibles. I've been in a series called When I Pray. When I Pray. When you pray. When we pray. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to work my way down just a little bit, and even deal with the end of chapter 6 just a little bit. But I want you to look at verse number 9 with me. When you're there, say amen. If you don't have your Bibles, it's on the monitors. It says, pray in this way, 
our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your, say it, name. name. Then it goes on to say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today I want to deal with your kingdom come, your will be done. You may be seated. Today in our modern society, a lot of words are being thrown around. Words like revelation and enlightenment and to be woke and consciousness. But today I want to talk about the word consciousness for a moment in its truest sense. The first thing I need you to understand, and I want you all to look at me, when we talk about the word consciousness, nothing exists outside of your consciousness. Let me say that again. Nothing exists outside of your consciousness. Which means, watch this, consciousness is what a person believes or consents to. I'm going slow because I want you to listen. What I believe or what I consent to. So if you believe you're sick and you consent to, then now you're conscious of being what you consented to. If you consent to being broke and believe you're, then. Now watch this. If I had something, if I hold in my hand two pieces of identical iron, would you say that they had to be the same? It's not a trick question. The answer is yes. I know sometimes you think I'm asking a trick. It's not a trick question. Two pieces of iron from the same fold, I hold them together, they're identical. Their makeup, their molecules have to be the same for them to be identified as iron. If one is different, then it can't be iron. Correct? Correct. All right. So now if I got two of them together holding them, they're the same. Came from the same batch were made at the same time. But then I take a magnet and put it on one of them, and I magnetize it. And as a result, it becomes magnetic. Now, here's a question. Are they still the same? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says I'm scared to answer? The truth of the matter is, you're both correct. Watch this. They're both the same but different. What do you mean? Watch this. What makes it up is still the same. What made this piece of iron magnetic is that the molecules were reorganized and rearranged such that now it attracts what it could not attract previously because of the rearrangement. But the makeup in the essence of the being is the same. Where, where is pastor going? Watch this. If that's the case, watch this. All minds have to be the same at the core. Which means if we think differently, it's because our minds are organized differently or were rearranged and if my mind is structured one way and I don't like how it's structured, a rearrangement could now cause it to draw and attract what it could not previously in the state it was in. Which means the man who is poor and the man who's rich have the same mind. The man who's a giver and the woman who's a beggar, same mind. 
The woman who's healthy and the woman who's sick, same mind. Arranged differently. That's why Proverbs 23 and 7 says, As a man or woman thinketh, so is he or so he becomes. As my mind is arranged, I have to become what the arrangement says I must be. So if I want to be transformed, the only way I can be transformed, transformed, made another person, is to rearrange my mind such that I can become the person I desire to be. The Bible says the mind makes the man. The mind makes the woman. But what happens when my mind has been arranged by somebody I didn't give permission to arrange it or somebody who did not know the result I wanted in my life or God wanted for me in my life? What if somebody arranged poverty when God wanted wealth? What if somebody arranged sickness and God wanted me well? Then, watch this, like a business that's struggling, I have to go through a restructuring. You can take a business that's struggling and restructure. That simply means rearrange it, put the right leadership in place, put the right people in place, give them the right information in isolation that leads to implementation. And the same business that was struggling can now become a thriving business because it was rearranged, re which means that, watch this, my mind right now may not be taking me where I want to go, but through a restructuring, a rearranging, a reorganizing, Y'all quiet in this Christian church. Maybe y'all like, everybody in here likes where they're going. Then if you don't like where you're headed, you might need a mental restructuring. Are you okay? Now watch this. Here's the place that you have to understand. The Bible says there's no curse without a cause which means whatever is happening in your life, your consciousness or how your mind is organized is perpetuating it. And while you're waiting for some external thing to change, what you have neglected or denied is that your internal is dictating your external. And if you keep blaming people and circumstances and situation for the wrong organization of your mind, then you'll stay where you've always been. Watch this. I'm going to show you. I'm in the Bible. How do I restructure and reorganize? Prayer. And the study of the word should restructure and reorganize your mind accordingly. But if you go into prayer with some pre-rehearsed, repetitive speech that you've been saying since you were six, nothing's changing because... You prayed because you were supposed to not to be transformed. You prayed because somebody told you you should. Before you get in bed, say your prayers. Before you eat some food, say your blessings. And what you're doing oftentimes is more out of ritual and routine than for transformation. And what I need is transformation. I don't need ritual and routine because watch this. We're doing the same thing, expecting a different result, wondering why it's not happening. 
When the Bible clearly says don't be like the Gentiles who use repetitiveness because they think they'll be heard because of their many words. They didn't go for transformation. They came, they came to display their, their, their vast vocabulary. Dear Father, Heavenly Father, Most High and Supreme God who sits high and look. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good. One dude was sitting up there praying. He was like, I'm glad I'm not like this cat. This cat right here, I pay my tithes, I pay my offerings, I do this, do that. And the other cat over there sitting on his chest said, Lord, have mercy on me. God needs some folks who pound on their chest and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Transform me from my neck up. I need a checkup from the neck up. Reorganize my mind. Restructure my life so that I can do those things that you called me to do. And everybody sitting in the room feels like I've been called to make some impact. Why am I not able to make it? Now watch this. I'm going to teach you something today. You've probably never heard it this way. But how God deals with me is not normal. We've been talking about prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This whole concept in the Bible of kingdom is probably the most misunderstood in Scripture. We say we're kingdom. Then somebody says, what does that mean? I don't know. We belong to the Lord. But is that all it means? Watch this. What is kingdom? Kingdom is a compound word made up of two words, king and domain. So when you say kingdom, you're talking about the king's domain. Watch this. It says, seek ye first the kingdom. I'm going to show you in a minute. How do we seek the kingdom? The king's domain. Well, what is the king's domain? The king's domain is the invisible domain of God that controls the visible from the invisible. Where God is, you can't see. But watch this. Hebrews 11 and 13 says, By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God so that what is seen has not been made out of things that are visible. The Bible says what you see was not made out of what you see. The Bible says what you see was made out of the unseen, which lets me know that the unseen, watch this, governs the seen, and it's the unseen that can change the seen. And so while you're trying to change the external, you need to change the internal because the internal comprises the unseen, and the Bible says the kingdom is in you. So in essence, if you get this, it'll change your life. One in a million people don't understand this. Your life is simply a projector. That means you're sitting in the movie theater right now, looking at what you thought about, what you pondered on, what you assumed to be true previously, now you're watching the results of what's been consented to on the inside, you're seeing it on the outside. And you sit in the movie theater like this here, oh God, what's going to happen next? But what's about to happen cannot be changed unless... The person who wrote the narrative goes back and changes it and reshoots it. And what's happening in your life is not going to change unless you go back and change the narrative and rewrite some stuff that has been written for you that other folks wrote for you, your beliefs, things that you believed and consented to that were not true because I told you perception is the ultimate reality but not necessarily the ultimate truth, which means what I perceive to be true might not be true. I know it's heavy preaching on a Sunday morning, but I just got to give you what God gave me. 
And so I share with people who, who do counseling with me, I tell them perception is the ultimate reality, but not necessarily the ultimate truth. I say, if you walk outside and the ground is wet, somebody says it rains, somebody said the sprinkler was on. And watch this, it's post people's reality now because they perceived it to be true, but it's not the truth. Either it rained or the sprinklers were on. So here's my question. What if you've been thinking it rained and the sprinklers were on? And the truth that you thought was truth was only perception that needed to be changed and replaced with truth so that your life could flow the way God designed for it to flow. We still all right? Now watch it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'm going to get to it. Let's talk about this kingdom. Matthew 6 and 25 through 33. For this reason I say to you, Jesus says, don't be worried about your life as to what you're going to eat or drink, nor your body as to what you're going to put on it. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And watch this. And which of you, by worrying, can add one single day to a lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice the lilies of the field. They grow. They do not labor. They do not spin, tread for clothes. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. Your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Seek his kingdom. Watch this. For years I've wondered and I've, I've, I've taught and God's given me more and more. And I've heard people say, seek his kingdom means go out and make disciples and, and do God's work. And if you do God's work, then God will take care of your work. And that's what he's saying. Then I heard people say that it's, it's God's way of business or doing business. The kingdom is God's way of doing business, which leaves me too vague. What does that mean? You're quiet in this Christian church. But what it's really saying is, seek the invisible domain of God that controls the visible domain that you're trying to alter. Watch this. Assume as reality what you're believing. Hold on to it, regardless of what you see, and God will add it. There might be a million theologians who will argue with me, seminarians, all of them. It's fine. Go ahead. Seek by assuming, I'm going to show you in Scripture, that what you've requested is fulfilled and you are the person that you're asking God to be now. Hold on to it despite the lack of evidence and God will add it or make it come to pass. Now, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I don't get up here just half cock. I, I got some stuff for you. Seeking the kingdom means using your imagination to assume the request with all of its feelings and emotions, and God will initiate the process that brings it to fruition. Seek the invisible realm, and I'll change your visible realm. Don't worry about it. Have faith. Watch this. Your free will is to determine what you're going to ask for. Make the request. But thy will, how it comes to pass, is my will. That's my lane. You want food? Assume you have food with a hungry belly. And I'll bring food. How I bring it is not up to you. Your part is just to determine the what. I determine the how. And you determine the what with all the feelings and the emotions of it being done already. Hold on to it, despite what people say. Call you crazy, stupid, ignorant. 
whatever you want, and I'll add it. I will initiate the process that will birth it. But the problem is, if you change your belief, I'll be forever starting new processes. And for most people, all I'm doing is you believe I start a process, and then when the process starts to unfold and you don't see how it's going to work, you change your belief. Then i got to change processes, and it's, it's, you're going between... He says, I'll add it. Add it means that you don't have to participate. It doesn't mean you won't have to do anything, but the process that brings it to pass, you don't organize that. You participate in it. But I do it. I create these moments of what you call synchronicity. When things line up and collide, I cause these cosmic collisions. I, I cause these... You walk out the hotel, and somebody walks out at the same time who got what you need. I caused that to happen. When you meet the banker at the grocery store, and his baby fell, and you picked it up and bandaged up the baby, and he says, what can I do for you? I work at the bank. I need a loan. Let me show you something heavy. I'm going to show you a scripture that we've looked at. I don't want to just say wrong, but incompletely. Can I say that? Genesis 27. It's the story of Isaac whose eyes are dimming. He can no longer see. He's got these two boys, Esau and Jacob. And he wants to bless them before he leaves. Because the father's job is to perpetuate the blessing and to pass on the blessing. The problem is, watch this, the first boy, Esau, is supposed to get the blessing because of his positioning. But the second boy, watch this, Jacob, is the child of promise. Now, when your promise, promise usurps position. supersedes position. I know you were supposed to have it, but you got position, but I got promise. And don't be mad when my promise outshines your position. And my promise puts me in the position that you used to occupy. I'm, watch this. So he's getting old. He can't see anymore. Um, remember that. I'm coming back for that. He's getting old. He can't see. Now watch this. Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his son Esau and said to him, my son, he said to him, the firstborn, he says, here I am. Then Isaac said, behold now, I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare a delicious meal for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. I'm passing the baton. I'm about to get out of here. Now, Rebecca was listening. While Isaac spoke to his son Esau. And so when Esau went to the field to hunt for game, Rebekah said to Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a delicious meal for me so that I may eat it and bless it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. So now, my son, watch this, she says, Listen to me as I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there so that I may prepare them as a delicious meal for your father, such as he loves, then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat so that, that he may bless you before his death. Now watch this. Everybody pay attention. 
because I'm telling you, for years I saw this, but I, I saw something different. But Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will touch me, and then will, then will be like a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go get the goats for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made delicious meals such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the beast's garment for her elder son Esau, which were in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put skins of the goats on his hands and the smooth part on his neck. She also gave delicious meal and bread, which she made for her son Jacob. So she now takes the other boy's clothes, takes the hair from the goats, puts it on the boy so that the blind man who can't see, if he touch him, he won't know the difference. Now, y'all st still with me? We got time, right? All right. Then he came to his father and said, my father, here I am. He says, who are you, my son? Watch this. He says, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done what you told me. Come sit and eat my game so that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, how is it that you got it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God made it come to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come so that I may feel you. Watch what he says. Come here. I got to feel you. I know the difference. I know how y'all feel. Come here. Let me feel you, my son whether you are Esau or not. So Jacob came close to his father Isaac and touched him and said, watch this, the voice of Jacob, but the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau's. So he blessed him and he said, are you really Esau? He said, I am. So he said, bring it to me and I will eat my son's game that I may bless you. And he brought it to him and he ate and he also brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, please come and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled him, he smelled his garments. And he blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and the abundance of the grain and new wine. Many people serve you and nations bow to you. Be masters of your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. Now watch this. We spent all of our time talking about the deceitfulness of Rebecca and the deceitfulness of Jacob. But we missed the point of the text. What do you mean? The point of the text is that she dressed this boy up to make him feel like his brother, and he got blessed. Now watch this. The blind father represents the subconscious mind in you, which is blind. And it's only moved by feeling. So when you feel like you already are somebody you're not, even though you're not, you get blessed like you are because all it has to go by is feelings. And the problem is all of your feelings have been associated with the negative stuff you don't want instead of the positive stuff that you do. And we've made it all about the deceitfulness of this boy and missed the fact that he dressed up like something he wasn't so that he felt a certain way and the feeling got the blessing. Which means if I can feel blessed when I look cursed, if I can feel healthy when I look sick, if I can feel wealthy when I'm broke, if I can if I can embrace a new me sitting in the place of the old me, 
God can add. I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. Not me, but I'm just telling you that it's been based on your feelings. And if you look at your life and how you felt, your energy, your excitement, your depression, what you feel bad about, and you've been getting more of what you feel bad about because you've expanded or extended more energy to that than to the person that God has called you to become. You don't think that's correct? Let's see what Jesus said about it. Jesus says in Mark 11 and 24, I'm in the Bible. I hadn't left it yet. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. That's what Jesus said. Jesus says, assume that it's done and it will be done But we haven't gone in prayer with a picture of things been done. You shouldn't be praying about what you don't have. You should be praising God for what you do have, but don't yet have. Did you get that? a lot of hums. Hmm. Hmm. So I told you a picture would change your life. That's why when God got ready to deal with Abraham, he gave him a new picture. He says, he says, he says, I don't have any descendants. He says, he says, yes, you will. He says, go outside and look at the stars. Can you number the stars? He says, no. He says, that's how your descendants will be. Why? Because I got to get you to embrace the new picture or you won't have any descendants. Look at the sand. Look at, and so he's constantly showing people new pictures. Moses says, who am I? He says, Moses, what you got in your hand? Throw it down. It becomes a snake. Pick it up. Let me show you. Let me show you a new picture of you so you can believe you. I'm closing. But here's the caution. Don't just believe God for stuff. Watch this. Watch this. And not become the person who can handle the stuff. (laughs) Or you will always lose the stuff. For whoever has, to him it shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But to whomever who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. What does that mean? To the person, watch this, who has not become in their mind who they're, they, they want to be, what they're blessed with will always be taken away and taken back to who they believe they are. So you wonder why people who win the lottery lose their money? Because they're not a person. You can have a million dollars and not be a millionaire. You, you can have a good spouse or somebody who loves you but not ready to be loved. And then you'll end up by yourself again. So the prayer is God transform me into the person I need to be so that I can handle all that you bestow upon me. Otherwise, something will happen to cause you to lose what you gain and bring you back to where you really are. How many times have you made big gains? Oh, I got $10,000, and then sudden break, air conditioner break, sudden break. Why is it breaking? Because you're not ready. It ain't coincidence. It didn't just break because. Let's go home. I know it's heavy and it's different from what you've ever heard. I, I know some of you are wrestling with it now. Hmm. But here's a heavy question. You've been told to seek the kingdom for years and, and you've been trying. Has it yielded any fruit? Hmm. 
maybe some of the things that we've been taught, not necessarily incorrect, but incomplete. And watch this. A lot of times in church, they want us to be modest. Don't worry about money. Don't worry. No, you need a picture of better. So that you can have better. Because if you keep them, oh, I'm going to be humble. I'm going to just stay. I ain't worried about no. You'll never have any. You'll never have what you hate. Never have what you talk about. So as I close today, watch this. Thy kingdom come. God gave you a picture of something great. Assume that it's done. Watch this. Take the picture that God gave you and say, regardless of where I am in my life, I'm going to hold on to this picture of what God showed me and assume it's done. Watch this. Until the evidence lines up with my belief. Because what you've been doing is you've been letting your belief line up with your evidence. Until my evidence lines up with my belief. Because when God works with you, here's what I've learned. He'll always put something out there for you so that you can grow and become. And watch this. People in church are so afraid to preach about having anything or doing anything because we don't want to be materialistic. No, it's not. You set goals to grow. Not just to have. What good is having something if you're still childish with it? Y'all ready to go home? <laughs> and so God transformed me, changed me into the person that you're calling me to be. It's not about materialism or having. It's about transformation so that I can grow and become this, and then God can set another goal out there, and then I can go and transform and become. You shouldn't be the person you were even yesterday or last year or last five years. Have I really changed have I, have I really been transformed? If somebody who saw me five years ago sees me today, would they notice any difference in me? Or would it just be the same old me? Or would they say, that's something different about that cat. Can't put my finger on it, but they ain't the same. The conversation's not the same. Attitude's not the same. Disposition, demeanor's not the same. God must be doing the work in their lives. Got it? Dear God, we come today by our heads, humble hearts. Asking God that you will continue to plant this word in our hearts. That you will continue to open the eyes of our understanding so that way we may be all that you've destined for us to be, Lord God. Father, we can't help poor folks if we stay poor. We can't help broken people heal if we don't ever get healed. And so, God, we need transformation. We need to become something greater, something better, so that we can reach back and pull others through the process. And so, Father, we thank you for this word. And as we leave this place, Lord, be with us. Not just be with us, but lead us and guide us, God. Put our hands on the right information, God. Groom us and grow us. Lead us on the right path. And, Father, as we prepare our hearts to give, God can even control our giving as we give to our tithes and offerings, building funds, things like that. If somebody here in life needs to be saved or they need to join this church, God, give them the courage to do so now. And, Father, we honor you in the mighty name of Jesus. We call it so right now. Amen. 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 If you're here right now, you need to give your life to the Lord. If you're here right now, you need to rededicate your life. If you're here right now, you want to join this church, then come. Come. It's simple. All you have to do is tell your neighbor, excuse me, I got to get up there. We won't make you make a statement or say anything. Simple. If that's you, will you come? Look at your neighbor and ask him, do you, you need me to walk up there with you? I know sometimes it's, it's embarrassing or, or, you know, you might be a little shy. I'll walk up there with you. We'll hang out together. Is that one? No? Amen. I'm, I'm good. I feel peace. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you.
Clap your hands. All right, family, before we go home, we always honor God in and through our giving. And uh, yes, we've been able to do so many things because of our generosity. All, all of us, we're, we're givers. We're givers. And watch this. There's no difference between a giver and a non-giver than a rearranging of the mind. And if you're not a giver right now, it's because you're worried about money. You think money is scarce. You think, you think if I give this, I ain't going to have. If a rearranging of the mind to understand that God is faithful and just, and he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or even think, that God can restore. God made a promise. He'll keep his promise. And so watch this. Two things that we're giving towards. We're giving towards our tithes and our offerings. We're giving towards our building fund. If you need a capital campaign envelope, if you don't have one, and you will see the one, uh, the, the pamphlet that you got in your hand with the one on it, because God's the one who's going to bring it to pass, but you're the one that God's going to do it through. I'm the one going to speak the word. It's always one. One person makes a difference. One, one person, one person makes a difference. And watch this. If you're sitting there thinking my giving won't make a difference, yes, it will. Yes, it will. My impact won't make a difference. Yes, it will. Me saying something to somebody won't make a difference. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. You are the one. The chosen one. Put your hands on yourself and say, I'm the chosen one. Who chose you? Say, God did. God chose me. God chose me. And guess what? Even if you didn't, he did. Yeah. So watch this. If you have not committed, have not committed, have not committed to a capital campaign number. On the envelope, there's a spot where you put your two-year contribution. Two-year contribution. Now, watch this. I know that's heavy because some people say, well, two years, that's a long time. Well, listen, start practicing your commitment. Yeah. Yeah, you've never been with a woman for two years? Try this capital campaign. Let's take step by step by step. Amen. But no, seriously, everybody, everybody can give something. And here's the thing. If you're afraid and say, well, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, just put a number you know you can do. And then if you can give more, give more. Yeah, if you can give more, give more. All right? And so if you have not given your capital campaign contribution uh, pledge, then watch this. And you're going to do it today. I want you to stand. Last week, by the way, Let's see where we are. We've raised about $60,000. We've raised about sixty. We have pledges now at about a quarter of a million. Yeah, about a quarter of a million. So we're about a fourth of the way there. And so we, we need some more folks to commit and join with us as, as, as we do this together. Amen? And if you do it together, if you, you commit today and you write that number down, I want you to come to the altar because I want to pray for you. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to be worried that, that you're not going to be able to do it. I want to pray over you, and, and I pray God gives you a peace and a confidence that you can do exactly what he said. Amen? Amen. So if you're going to give your capital contribution or campaign, even if you don't give anything towards it today, you want to write the amount down or you want to give towards it, two things I'm telling everybody. Tithes and offerings in this season has to be tithes and offerings, and building has to be building. You can't take one from the other. Or we'll just get the same thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, my daughter's writing something on there, and she don't have a job. So, yet. She do have a job, but she ain't started working yet. And so, if she can commit something, that's faith. I know you can do something. Amen? So, if you want to do that, we're going to give. But come on. I want to pray for you if you're doing that right now. Come on. Come on up. Come on. Yes. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on, clap for him, church. What a wonderful. Yes. Touch, touch me. Touch me. Yes. Yes. Hey there. Give me a pound anyway. Amen. 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 Yes. 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 Megs. <laughs> Amen. Put him there. And listen, Brother Montgomery had a, a, a wonderful idea on Thursday night, he said, Pastor, what about people who have these big buckets of spare change? Can they bring those? I said, yeah, bring them. We'll take them to the bank and dump it right on the counter. Just put that in our account. Yeah, and so we got some of, we got some of those. How many people got a, a, one of those jugs? 
Now watch this. If you're in a season and you're living out that jug, just keep it. Just keep it. You go through those seasons sometime. You know what I'm saying? But if it's just sitting there collecting dust and you can afford, you know, put it towards your campaign. Amen? Anybody else coming? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else before we pray? Amen. I see you holding it back there. Yes, ma'am, Sister Mildred. You ain't got to walk. I got you. Amen. 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 You can hold it. I'm going to let you drop it in a minute. It's fine. Stay where you are. Father, we thank you for this day and for everybody who has made this commitment. And oh, what a commitment, God. A commitment to say, you know what? I'm going to put aside something that I could use for myself and use it to be an asset, God, so we can build this building where we can educate our kids, where people can be saved. Somebody who may be suicidal can come in and have their lives changed, get hope, redemption, restoration. Oh, God, what a joy. But, Father, this is my prayer, that nobody suffers for what they give. That, God, that they would experience increase in the midst of giving. Oh, God, I know that you can do it. Not only that you can, I believe you are. In fact, I declare it done in the name of Jesus. And, God, I thank you, God, that as they give, they say, man, it seems like I got more than I had before I gave. And, God, as they give, that it just keeps overflowing and coming back. Because today we're not spending money. They're circulating money. Currency is supposed to flow. And as they flow it through rows here, God, flow it back to them 30, 60, 100 times over, God. We thank you for it right now. And God, not only those who are giving capital campaign, but those who are giving anything, Lord God. God, don't let them spend it. Let them circulate it. Let it come back, pressed down, shaking together and running over. In this season, God, where gas prices are going up and inflation is increasing, let us prosper, God, as a sign that we are your children and that you are our source and jobs and all that other stuff is just resources. And so, Father, we thank you for prospering regardless of the economy, regardless of what the government does, regardless of what the president or anybody else says. You are our source. And we thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Clap your hands if you receive it. All right. Drop it in, drop it in, drop it in. And those in the seats, God bless you. Those who are in the seats. You may, uh, you may serve them. Amen. You may serve them. Look at all these young people up here giving. What a blessing that is. Let me tell you something. One of the greatest things that you can do is teach your kids how to give, how to share, how to share. Amen. Because, you know, when kids are little, you have to teach them how to be stingy. Yeah, they know how to do that. Mine. But no, teach them. No, it's not just about you. Share what you have. And guess what? I got a series coming up about, about giving. Real soon. Real soon. Because I want us to have a good understanding about giving and prospering. And Amen? Amen. You know we ought to have some millionaires in here. Stop being afraid to say it. Stop being afraid to say it. Put your hands on yourself and say, yeah, me, that's me. I'm a millionaire. I'm not waiting until I get it to call myself that. I'm calling myself that now. Here's a heavy question. Watch this. Heavy question. If God bless you with money, would, would, do you think you would do better stuff with it than some folks out there who just, then shouldn't you have it? If you're going to bless people and use it wisely, not saying you ain't going to have some fun and go on vacations. Yes, you are. You better. But you see somebody in line, can't make ends meet. You ain't going to stand up there and just be like, too bad for them. No, you're going to pull it out. No, uh -uh, let them babies eat. That's who we need to have the money. So we got to change the narrative in the church. We need to have resources. Amen. 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 All right. Listen, a uh, few announcements. Let me make sure we got everything covered. Man, for all of our graduates on yesterday, our daughter Megan graduated from LSU. Yes, she did. We are so godly proud of you, Megan. Yes, we are. And watch this. She did it in three years. Three years. And I'm going to brag on her just a little bit because every parent should. They said in the program, the youngest person graduating is 20, and the oldest is 67. 
And guess who one of the youngest was? She's 20. Yeah. So shout out to Megan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Zoe. Hello. Yes. That's it. When I first started pastoring, I got a picture on my wall. They were baby babies. And now they graduate in college. What do you think about that? All right. Listen, a few things. Don't forget about Recap Bible Study. Recap Bible Study has been so good. It's been so good. So good. And listen, I haven't even pushed it hard because I only want people to come who want to come. So if you don't want to come, guess what? I don't want you to come. But if you do want to come, I want you to come. Amen? Have you ever heard a pastor say that? I'm telling the truth, though. If you have the gift of teaching, we need some teachers in our youth department. Minister Tim right there is the man to see if you would like to volunteer to teach. You don't have to know a whole lot about Sunday school and teaching and all that stuff. We can teach you all of that stuff. You just have to have a heart for kids and most of our heart for God. Amen. And we can we can help you with the rest. Um, don't forget our youth church. We, we have it at the 9 o'clock or 9.15 hour. We only have nursery at the 11 or 11.15. So if you come later, we won't have all the classes. And uh, yes. Anybody else graduated? Where is, where is, I see him back there. Hey, Rod, you graduated, man. Congra all right, come here. Come here. Who else? All right, man, come on, man. That's what I'm talking about. We're going to have a graduation day, but listen, everybody, all y'all come here for a minute. Just come here. Let me see you. I'm going to put my eyes on you. I'm bragging about Megan. Heck, let me brag about y'all. Come on. There he is. There, there he is. That's Zoe and Ra. Yes, yes, yes. Clap for them. Yes. Great job. They all went to school together right there. All right. Yes. Congratulations, man. Good job. Come on, clap for her. Let her get up there. Come on. Come on up here. Now, listen, y'all do me a favor. Stand up for him and clap real big for him. That's a wonderful. Yeah. Give me, a, give me a microphone. Give me a microphone. Hurry up. Let me see. Let me see. Say your name and where you graduated from. Oh, that's for your baby? All right, go ahead, Megan. So. Amen. All right, yes. Help out. What's your name? Jesse? Pre-K. All right. Come on, Rob. First grade, yes. Yes. <laughs> you don't have to make Zoe talk. She will talk. <laughs> if he don't want to, it's fine. You say it. Say his name. We're proud of him. Yes. We're proud of him. Amen. Come on, my brother. All right, Liberty, yes. Give it to my brother right there. All right. And he's been serving. They've been so faithful serving. So proud of them. Amen. Is that everybody? My, my son, he didn't graduate yet. He got a little way to go. She said, what about your son? Yeah, he... He's in a five-year program. He's got four more years, four more years. <laughs> but thanks for asking, though. <laughs> All right. Y'all ready to go home? Amen. Listen, I speak the blessings of the Lord over you. I speak peace. I speak prosperity. I speak joy. I speak traveling grace in Jesus' name. The saints of God said amen. God bless you. Go in peace. See you Thursday. See you next Sunday. Have a great day. Congratulations, graduates. So proud of y'all. Next.